everyone, it's Krithika. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about the tourist visa that you need to travel to Europe, the Schengen visa. So a few months ago, I visited Europe. Uh, this was back in November and I did another trip in Feb as well this year. And I'm planning to go back to Europe. So I'm applying for a Schengen visa again. This is my fourth time applying for it. And last time when I uh, did my trip to Europe, I got so many questions about the visa process and how to apply for it. So I thought since I'm applying right now, I've got all my documents here. Uh, this was the best time to actually make this video. So in this video, I'm going to try and cover as much as possible from what Schengen visa is, when to apply, how to apply, whether to do it yourself or through an agent, the cost of the visa and also towards the end of this video, I'm going to be answering some of your questions as well. So this is going to be a long video, but I hope you find this useful. Before we start, a quick disclaimer. I am not an expert on Schengen visa. What I'm sharing today is just based on my experience. And uh, this is my fourth time applying for this. So I've gotten it thrice in the past, the past four years, in fact. So even though I've researched, uh, if you feel like something I've said is not right, do feel free to correct me in the comments, because like I said, I'm not an expert on this topic. But starting off, what exactly is Schengen visa? So Schengen visa is the visa that you need to be able to enter the Schengen region, which consists of 26 countries in Europe. So if you're planning a trip to Europe, for example, if you want to do a trip to France, Germany, any of the Schengen countries, you're going to need a Schengen visa to be able to actually enter Europe. For the sake of this video, I'm only talking about tourist visas because I don't really have any experience with work visas and stuff like that. So when it comes to tourist visas, there are three different types of visas that um, are available. So there's a single entry visa, a two time entry visa and a multiple entry visa. And I've gotten all three in the past uh, three visas that I've gotten. So like the name suggests, a single entry lets you uh, enter the Schengen region once. And once you leave, that visa is not valid anymore. A double entry visa lets you enter the Schengen region twice. And a multiple entry visa lets you enter and leave the Schengen region as many times during the validity of the visa. So the thing with Schengen visa is that the duration is not something that you can choose. Uh, it really depends on them what duration visa they give you. The first time I think I got only a two week visa when I went to Iceland. The second time I got a six month visa and the third time I got a three month visa. So there's no logic as to how many days visa they're going to give you. Um, it really depends on luck because I know some people who have applied for the second time and gotten a one year visa and people who are very well traveled also just getting a one month visa. So not really sure how this works. If you know, let me know in the comments below. Now, how this whole process works is that in India and I think in most countries around the world, the Schengen visa has been outsourced to this company called VFS. So if you're applying for a Schengen visa, you will have to do it through VFS. Uh, they have offices in major cities around India. The closest center for me is Chennai, so which is three hours away. That's where I'm going to have to go. So you first need to figure out which country's embassy you will be applying to. So typically, if you're doing a trip and you're visiting multiple countries uh, within the Schengen region, which usually is the case if you're doing a Europe trip, then you need to apply to the country where you'll be spending the maximum number of days. And for example, if you have two countries where you're spending an equal number of days, then you should be applying to the country where you're flying into. So hypothetically, say you fly into Paris, but you're spending 10 days in Switzerland and 10 days in Austria, then you should be applying to the French embassy. So you need to first figure out which country's embassy you'll be applying to because um, that's the website you will have to go to to book your appointment. So once you've figured out which country, the first step is to go to that country's VFS page. So for the sake of this video, let's take France, for example. So you just look up France VFS, go to their website and uh, the process is quite straightforward because they have explained everything uh, on their website as well. So you definitely need to go through that too. So first they ask you to fill out a form. Now the online form is pretty straightforward. They ask you a bunch of questions when you're entering, when you're planning to leave the Schengen region. Uh, your ID proof, your passport number, details like that. So this form you'll have to submit when you go for your visa application. So you can also fill this form later on once you get your appointment. Uh, I filled it before I got my appointment. So after this, you need to book your appointment. And these days I've been hearing that there have been major delays with appointments. So I'm planning to travel a month from now. I was taking it very light until I read newspaper articles about how there are major delays. So literally, I think two days ago, uh, I booked a slot for myself and my appointment is tomorrow. I got lucky and I got a slot, but supposedly they are booked right now because travel is picking up. So if you're planning a trip, try to plan it a little in advance. Usually you get your visa in a few days under a week, but best not to leave it for the last minute. I still have a month before I leave India after my appointment. So hopefully it should be fine. So to make an appointment, just choose whatever dates available and works for you, whatever time slot works for you. And you have to pay a service fee to VFS. I paid, let me see. 
2,688 rupees. Uh, this may be different for other embassies, but more or less, I think this is the ballpark figure which you pay in service fees. This is not the amount you pay for the visa that you pay at the VFS center. So once this is done, your appointment is booked and you just have to make um, arrangements for all your documents before your appointment. So I'll get to the documents in a bit, but yeah, basically that's the process. And on the day of your appointment, you go to the VFS center and they just walk you through the whole process. The staff there, in my experience, they've been really nice and helpful. Even if any of your documents are incorrect or the photocopies are wrong, they sort of guide you through the process and help you out as much as possible. So yeah, you just go from like counter to counter. They verify your documents, then you do your biometrics, they take your picture, then you, they collect your passport and you can opt for either a pickup of your passport or a courier. And because I live in Velour, I don't really want to go three hours away again to just pick up my passport i always opt for the courier option and it's pretty safe and this is an additional fee so over there you have to pay for the visa you have to pay for the courier if you opt for that and they have a bunch of other services like an sms alert service and overall the cost including the service fee comes up to like 10,000 rupees I think again this is a ballpark figure and I think it may be different from like country to country and when you get your passport is when you actually get to know if you got your visa or not so that's sort of the process and now moving on to the question that I get asked the most what documents do you have to submit now as you can see this is quite a lot uh, kind of annoying that you have to submit so many documents each time but it is what it is so firstly there's the cover letter so this is either a one or mine is like one and a quarter page long but uh, basically a letter that you write to the embassy explaining uh, why you want to travel, the purpose of your visit, documents that you're enclosing and any other information that you want to add. So essentially with visas, the whole thing that you want to prove to the visa officer is that you have stake in India, that you plan to come back to India, whether it's a job, some property or anything that can prove to them that you will come back to India and not illegally immigrate to like some other country so in your cover letter if you have any points additionally from the documents that you're submitting you can mention that so in mine i have sort of mentioned the dates where i'm traveling i've also mentioned that i'm a travel content creator i've traveled to so many countries and i've also requested for a long-term visa i don't know if it'll work but i've mentioned that uh, this is my fourth time applying for a schengen visa so i've requested them to give me a longer duration visa if possible and I've also made a list of the documents that I'm submitting along with my application. So that's the first thing. Next is the visa appointment letter. So when you book your appointment, you get this uh, PDF document which you need to print out and carry on the day of your appointment. And this also has the receipt for how much service fee you paid to them. Uh, next is the visa application form. I filled it online and I've printed it out. And this has very generic questions like your date of birth, place of birth, passport number. One tip for this form is that they also ask you if you want a single or a multiple entry visa and I feel like it's better to just put multiple entry because um, the cost of the visa is the same anyway. So I have picked multiple entry and yeah, they ask you how you're gonna fund your trip. This is fairly straightforward, you can fill this out. Next is the travel insurance. Now the annoying thing about the Schengen visa, which I haven't really noticed with other visas, is that you kind of have to submit all your bookings and make all your bookings in advance before you even get the visa. So there's a possibility that your visa gets rejected, but you still book flights and hotels and got in travel insurance. So that's just something uh, you have to do. Uh, there are agents who also make reservations, flight reservations and stuff for you. So you can use their service and not really incur the cost of the actual flight booking and hotel bookings and stuff. I've never done that. So I'm not really sure how good or bad that is. I've usually heard it's good. But yeah, I'm doing it myself. I have already paid for my travel insurance, so I'm hoping I get the visa. So I am actually flying to London. I'm not really flying into the Schengen region directly. I had a UK visa, that's how this trip came about actually. I have a UK visa that's expiring in a month and a half. So I figured I'd go to UK and if I'm going to the UK, I might as well uh, visit Europe as well. And I really love Europe. I feel like there's so much to see and this time I'm going to try and cover newer countries. So anyway, for the purpose of the Schengen visa, you need to have coverage of up to 30,000 euros, I think. I typically get travel insurance for all my trips even if it's not required and I try to opt for the maximum coverage. It's just a couple of thousand rupees more for that and you get so much more benefit. I've never had to use it thankfully but that's the thing with insurance. It's something you spend money on that you hope you never have to use. So I got an insurance which is actually a 120 day policy uh, but I'm only traveling for three months. 
So I paid 6,400 rupees for this and that's just a cost that I've had to incur. Next are copies of my passport. So you need to submit your passport along with photocopies of your first page and your last page and also any relevant visas. So I have had three Schengen visas in the past. So I've got copies of that. I have a valid US visa and a valid UK visa. So I've got copies of that as well. And also immigration stamps proving that I've actually traveled using these visas. But uh, something to keep in mind is that your passport should actually be valid for three months um, after your trip ends to the Schengen region. So say for example, uh, your trip is ending in August end, then your passport should be valid till November end at least. You also need to submit two passport size photos. So I usually get them printed in bulk so that it comes in handy. But something to keep in mind with visa passport photos, like when you're getting it done, tell them it's for a visa because the specifications are different because your face needs to cover like 80% of um, the picture and your ears need to be visible. So I have my hair tied up. I don't know if you can see. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, but they ask you for two passport size photos. Then there are my flight bookings. I'm flying into London. So I have my flight from Chennai to London and I'm flying from Zurich to Bali actually. I'm not coming back to India. I have a group trip planned in September in Bali with subscribers. There are four more spots left I think in that trip. So I'll leave a link in the description if you want to book that trip or uh, do go ahead. I'd love to travel with you. But yeah, I've got these two flights booked and I paid for them completely. So uh, typically if you go through an agent, I think the agent only charges you a small amount or I'm not exactly sure how it works. They make dummy bookings or reservations for you. If it's your first time applying for a Schengen visa and you're doing it yourself, uh, I would say that try to book like a fully refundable flight because in case you don't get your visa or something goes wrong, you have the option of cancelling it uh, and you can also always get your visa and then cancel it and book a cheaper flight. That's an option as well. And typically I feel like economy, flexi, flights are fully refundable so you could do that. Next is my itinerary. So mine is just a two-page itinerary. I've sort of mentioned that from say for example 26th to 31st I'm in this country, 31st to 2nd I'm in this country. So it doesn't have to be super detailed but they sort of do want to know where you are throughout the entire trip, which countries you're going to and what you're doing. So this can be like a rough itinerary. You can always deviate from this in reality as well because a lot of times plans change last minute. My last trip I was thinking I'm gonna do a lot of Western Europe. My plan was Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, all of that but because of Covid I couldn't do that so I ended up doing something completely different. But yeah for the sake of the visa you need to show them a proper itinerary of what you're doing each day. So if you're going through like a travel agent who's organizing the trip for you they will ideally give you like plan for your entire trip and you can submit that and if you're doing it yourself you can just create something on word or excel and that's what i've done if you're booking your tour through a travel company i'd imagine it's easier to get a visa because you've sort of um, made the payment to them and there's proof of that so they know that you are actually like going to spend that money and go to europe and come back uh, that's what i've heard but anyway next these are all my hotel bookings so this is kind of an annoying thing you have to do, but you need to show where you're staying throughout your trip. And they say that you don't necessarily have to book all your hotels, but if you have enough money in your account, um, it says along with my appointment letter here that, you know, either submit copy of confirmed prepaid hotel reservation or show that you have up to 120 euros per day of your trip. So I feel like it's always better to just make hotel bookings because these days you can also make um, bookings which are fully refundable so that's what I do. Uh, I do end up staying in hotels but I feel like my plans end up changing last minute sometimes as well so you have the flexibility if you book something that's fully refundable whether it's flights or hotels. My flights I didn't actually book refundable options they were way more expensive but yeah all of these hotels uh, for the two months that I'm in Europe uh, I have made bookings for and if you're going to visit a friend or family then you also need to mention that in your form and you can also get an uh, invitation letter from them as well. The next set of documents are to prove that um, you can actually afford this trip so they're related to your personal income and they're different for if you have a job versus if you're self-employed. So in my case I'm self-employed and firstly I am submitting my GST registration certificate so if you're a registered company uh, in my case because I'm a sole proprietor in my company the GST registration certificate will do but whatever company registration certificate you have you have to submit that 
then i have got my bank statements so i have two different bank accounts and one is my personal account one is my business account so they ask you for bank statements for the last three months and uh, this can't be generated online you need to actually ask your bank to generate it and have it signed and stamped by them on their letterhead and stuff so a lot of people ask me how much minimum balance you need to have uh, in your bank account when you're applying for a visa and i don't think there's a rule as such for that so typically you want to have enough money to fund the rest of your trip after your flights and your hotels and all of those arrangements are taken care of. So I've heard that for two weeks, maybe having like one and a half to two lakh rupees in your bank account is good enough. I'm doing a two month trip, so I have like a considerably higher amount in my bank. And also you can't just put like two lakh rupees two days before your visa appointment or to show that you have that much money. You need to show that there's been movement in your bank account and you know you need to maintain that as your minimum balance the last three months because that's what you're submitting and apart from this you also need to submit your income tax returns for the past three financial years so i have got that here as well and if you're a salaried employee then you also need to submit your pay slips for the last three months and apart from that you also need to get an noc signed by your hr saying that you're going on leave and you will be back uh, joining work back on this particular day so those are documents that they ask for but apart from this you can also submit additional documents if you feel like that will support your application so i am also attaching my um investments like an account summary of my investments because i have like a decent amount of investments so hopefully this will also prove to them that i am making decent money and i can afford this trip you can also add your credit card statements or whatever you feel um, adds to your application but these are more or less the documents that they ask you for so you need to have almost all of these in place before your appointment in my case i only had two days to arrange for all of this so i have been going crazy yesterday and today um, arranging all of this but finally i have them all in place a few of you also asked me questions about the schengen visa on instagram and i think i've covered most of them but the ones i haven't uh, i'll try to answer them here what if i'm not sure about the dates and have to reschedule due to covid so unfortunately with the schengen visa you kind of have to be sure about your dates because sometimes they give you the visa's validity only for those specific dates. So when I went to Iceland, it was like a two week trip and they gave us a 15 day visa just for those two weeks. Sometimes they're generous and give you like a three month visa or a six month visa, which has also happened with me. Uh, but you can't be sure that they will do that. So you do need to uh, be sure about your dates. And if there are any last minute cancellations and if you don't get a longer term visa, you unfortunately just have to face the cost of that. So um, during my last trip, because I knew there were so many last minute changes happening because of covid everything that i booked was fully refundable so even if my trip were to get cancelled i wouldn't have faced as much of a loss because my flights my hotels everything was fully refundable because of which it was slightly more expensive but i think it was worth paying given how much things were changing back then in november when we travel by train to two different countries how does visa stamping work so if you're traveling to different countries within the schengen zone uh, they don't really stamp your visa once you enter the schengen zone is when they stamp it and when you're leaving is when they stamp it as well so within the schengen region for example i took a train from paris or uh, france to the netherlands i took a train from switzerland to italy they do check your passport but they don't really stamp it so there's no stamping involved what if we don't have any income tax returns so i'm guessing if you don't file income tax returns your income is probably at that level where you're not required to file income tax returns so in that case you'll probably have to explain in your application how you're funding your trip because uh, traveling to europe is relatively expensive so that's something to keep in mind if you have enough funds in your account investments and all of that um, then that helps but i feel like Ideally, you should be filing your income tax returns. I know people who haven't filed it and then didn't end up getting their visa. So um, I would say maybe consult like an agent for this because I'm not exactly sure. If I have a multiple entry one year visa, does the country that I enter first always have to be the country that issued the visa? Uh, no, it does not. So even in my case, last time I applied to the French embassy and first time I flew to Paris and the second time I flew to Switzerland uh, in February. My Schengen visa got rejected last week. Should I reapply and will I have to pay again for the VFS appointment? So yeah, you will have to pay for the VFS appointment and for your visa again. Uh, but I feel like if you know why your visa got rejected, if you feel like you missed out on any documents, then it's worth applying again to the same embassy. Otherwise, I would say it's probably a better idea to wait for a few months and then reapply. Since your last trip was largely unplanned, how did you apply for Schengen visa without stay bookings? 
so i did have stay bookings i mean like i said you kind of need to have an itinerary and bookings and stuff when you're applying for the visa so i did have all of that and i had a rough idea of what i wanted to do it's just that my trip uh, ended up being something completely different because i wanted to do belgium netherlands germany france and uh, those countries switzerland i did go to switzerland but i was only there for four days that time uh, but because of covid after i got there like these countries announced lockdown so i had to change my plans and then i ended up going to spain italy and like a few other places isn't there a rule that you can visit the schengen area once in every 180 days or six months so the rule says that you can basically be in the schengen region for 90 days within 180 days but the 180 days isn't absolute, so it sort of rolls over. So you basically need to look at the date when you're entering the Schengen region. Um, go back like six months and see how many days you've already spent. So for me, because I'm going, uh, I think I'm entering the Schengen region in the end of July. So if you backtrack six months, uh, my November, December trip doesn't even count in that six months. And in Feb, I only spent two weeks there. So I still have like a month and a half that I can spend in the Schengen region in that 180 day period. So I hope that makes sense, but uh, this is assuming you get a visa that lets you stay for 90 days. If you get a one month visa, obviously that's not valid. And if you get a longer term visa, like a one year visa, even then this rule applies. So you can only spend 90 days within 180 days in the Schengen region. So those were all the questions. Hope you found this video useful. I will keep you guys posted on whether or not I get the visa, the validity of it and all of that, uh, probably on Instagram stories. So if you're not following me there, do follow me for more daily updates. And if you have any questions, I've tried to cover as much as possible. But if you have any questions that I haven't covered in the video, you can comment and let me know. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.